Welcome to this podcast from Family Action Network. Our speaker is Robert Brooks, Ph.D. He is on the faculty of the Harvard Medical School, as well as the author or co-author of 15 books, among them Raising Resilient Children. He spoke to an audience of 400 on Thursday evening, January 17, 2013, at New Trier High School in Northfield, Illinois. The topic of the talk was Fostering Family Closeness and Respect. More information about and by Robert Brooks is available on his website, www.drrobertbrooks.com. Following an introduction by Family Action Network co-chair Lonnie Stonich, Robert Brooks' talk starts about 2 minutes and 15 seconds into the recording. The question and answer session for this event was not recorded. The event was sponsored by FAN in partnership with Nutrier High School's Ethical Conduct and Global Citizenship Parent Committee, District 39, Highcrest Middle School and Wilmette Junior High School, Avoca School District 37, Glencoe School District 35, Kenilworth School District 38, Sunset Ridge School District 29, Winnetka School District 36, North Shore Academy, and Regina Dominican High School. FAN is grateful for its 2012-2013 sponsors, Compass Health Center, North Shore Community Bank, the Bookstall at Chestnut Court, the Martin and Mary L. Boyer Foundation, and Tina and Byron Trott. All rights to this audio are the property of the Family Action Network. No commercial use of the recording is permitted. More information about the event is available at the Family Action Network website www.familyactionnetwork.net. Now to the introduction of Robert Brooks. A fabulous man. You're in for a real treat. It's, um, you're going to love the vibe that you have here tonight. Uh, Robert Brooks is on the faculty of Harvard Medical School and has served as director of the Department of Psychology at McLean Hospital. He is the author or co-author of 15 books and numerous articles and book chapters, His lectures on motivation, resilience, parenting, family relationships, and balancing our personal and professional lives have influenced thousands. My pleasure, Bob Brooks. (laughs) Don't fall. Okay. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. You know, I know I speak to kids much better than adults, I guess. It was really a pleasure. I remember when... uh, I met Eno, and uh, I said, oh, a kid is here, and you just took everything in. It felt so really uh, great. Uh, And Lonnie, I want to thank you so much. Uh, You're just a remarkable person to put all of this together, and I know there are about 30 co-sponsors. I don't know how you do it, but I've been so looking forward to this uh, day, and I was very, uh, I really enjoyed the uh, video that was shown, and um, I think the community is very fortunate to have a group like FAN and to have a person like you uh, putting these together. Because I just feel, well, I I just feel totally flattered being among all of the uh, other speakers you mentioned because they are quite renowned. I also uh, must say I always get a little nervous when I hear such a nice introduction because a number of years ago, um, after one of my talks, I'd gotten a nice introduction, and after one of my talks, a woman in the audience, and to this day, I don't know if she was kidding, uh, she raised her hand, and I said yes, and she said, you know, your sons were very fortunate to grow up in your home. Well, I thought they were, and uh, but I was wondering why, and I said, well, why do you say that, though? And she said, you know, just your presentation, you seem to know exactly what to say and do. I bet when you discipline them, they thank you for disciplining them. And she's going on and on, and I'm getting more and more nervous. So let me start, and you'll hear why I'm starting this way. I have learned something. In your own home, your children refuse to read your resume. You could be wonderful, but they are not necessarily going to read your resume. So I'll tell you a little story. My sons are grown now. I have four grandkids. But when my sons were that lovely age of about 10 and 13, any of you have young teenagers? Ah, you think they were put on this earth to make you feel good. (laughs) At that point, I was appearing regularly on a couple of television shows in the Boston area on Channel 5, the ABC affiliate. And I love how young teenagers always try to find something that may upset you, your Achilles heel. So any time they would get upset with me, Uh, This was their ultimate threat. One of these days, we're going to get on Channel 5 and reveal the kind of father you really are. I mean, you know, this was it. 
And I, I wasn't worried. I said, I will never bring my sons on any television show I do. Well, sometimes you cannot predict what is going to happen in life. Channel 5 called me, said, Bob, you know, you've done our Father's Day special for the last two years. I said, oh, I loved it. They lined up four or five men, and I uh, interviewed them about being fathers. They said, would you like to do it a third year? I said, yeah, I loved it the first two years. Why wouldn't I? Well, they said, well, this year we would like to change the format. Now, sometimes I'm a little too impulsive for my own good, and I just quickly said, whatever the format. I am very flexible. They said, well, that's great, because this year we would like you to bring on your two sons. I immediately said, I do not think they would be interested. (laughs) They were very interested because my sons are sports nuts like I am, and at that point they was a boxing champion from the Boston area, Marvin Hagler. He had already been booked to bring on two of his sons, and at that point Timothy Johnson, the medical editor of ABC, was going to bring on his daughter. I won't bore you with details except to say this was a live show. Do you know what that means? (laughs) Nothing could be cut which was one of the biggest mistakes I made because at one point they turned to my son Douglas, all of 10 years old. The first part was great. They said, hey, Doug, what's it like having a father who lectures about raising kids, writes about raising kids, appears regularly on television to talk about raising kids? What is he like? And it was as if Douglas had been waiting all 10 years of his precious life for this moment. (laughs) Because without hesitating for a second, looking straight at the camera on this live show, Douglas said, well, look, What my father says on television and what he does at home are entirely two different things. (laughs) So I haven't seen him for 30 years. If he's in the Chicago area, tell him all is forgiven. Well, I think what made it even worse was I think 200,000 people watched the show. Someone said, how would you know? I said, because I think I bumped into all of them on the streets of Boston that week. People actually came up to me and said, is it true? I said, well, look, a little of it's true. If there was any psychologist looking over my shoulders from the time my sons were first born, there'd be many occasions where that psychologist would say, I don't believe you said that. I don't believe you did that. You took TV away for five years. You did this and this and this. Because, of course, there's no such thing as a perfect parent. And I'll tell you why I tell you this story. I thought, you know, I was telling the uh, teachers and other people who were here this afternoon Uh, that I really got interested in topics like hope and resilience and optimism in the 1970s. And as I started giving talks and workshops, I said, this is really going to be great. I mean, look at these positive topics, hope, resilience. How can you go wrong? Then I found out something. You want to hear the most typical responses I heard from parents, especially after these talks? I feel so guilty now. Everything you said I should be doing, I'm not. Everything you said I shouldn't be doing, I am. So let me tell you something, because I want a really positive attitude here tonight. There is to be no guilt here tonight. Okay, maybe just a little. You know what? Guilt weighs you down. Look, in my clinical practice with adults, I say, look, I'll give you two sessions for guilt. Get it out of your system. Then we can move forward. And once managed care came in, you got 10 minutes to get rid of the guilt. Then we can move forward. Hey, what you've done, what I've done, we've done. You know what I'm much more interested in? If you hear one new idea tonight that you could immediately start using with your families and yourself, then you have a responsibility to use it. So I want you to sit back, relax. I'm going to share with you a 40-plus year journey as a father, as a psychologist, as someone who's been very blessed in his life and his career, I feel, and working with so many, many different families in different settings, uh, and share with you some thoughts about this topic of fostering family closeness and respect which ties so much to all my writings on resilience. Years ago, I became very interested in why is it that some people could overcome great adversity and some could not. I was working in the inner city of Boston, and I wondered how some people could grow up under racism and poverty and maintain such a dignified, optimistic attitude. Most of my career was spent, as Lonnie had mentioned in the introduction, in a psychiatric hospital And one of my toughest jobs there was running a locked door unit for children and adolescents. And as we did follow-up studies, I was really amazed how some people did so nicely in life. Not everyone, but some did. And so I I really said, I was a young psychologist then, I said, you know, maybe you're spending too much time on things that really lead people not to feel very good. Maybe you have to really start looking at this question. 
What are the most important things in a person's life that will help them to be more hopeful and optimistic and more resilient? And as I mentioned to the group who's here this afternoon, because it's such a key concept and it's going to be a key concept tonight, in every study that was ever done, when, when psychologists interviewed adults who had really overcome...